Hi, friends. Welcome to our worship this morning. It's so good to be together as we worship Jesus, as we sing songs, as we read scripture, as we hear a message, and as we have a conversation with God. And so I would just ask as you prepare for this worship that you would just open up your hearts to receive all that God has for you. God never has an empty hand. Do you know that? God's hands are always filled with gifts to give us understanding, to give our minds comfort, to give our hearts. And so today is kind of a special day, isn't it? The world is celebrating Mother's Day. And so what I know and what you know is we've got a lot of moms and dads out there that are working really hard for our kids, keeping our kids in homeschool and keeping the the meals on the table, three meals, just so much that's going on. So we just wanted to give a little, a little shout out of sweetness to mom. So take a look. My mom is cool, thoughtful, and kind. Our mom is a blessing. She's amazing and awesome. She is amazing. She's pretty. And I love her, and she's so nice to me. And I love you. Mwah. So we're going to start out with a question today. And that question is, where have you seen God show up unexpectedly during COVID-19? We'd love to hear from you. So you can just respond on the chat if you wouldn't mind. Have you seen God show up unexpectedly? In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender. You are breaking new ground, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel, make me an offering. 
pray together. Lord Jesus, it feels these days as if we are a bit pressed and crushed. But in the crushing, I pray that you would just help us to see the new thing that you're doing. As we move through this journey during this season, help us to keep our eyes upward and outward, that we would just always be mindful of your goodness. We thank you by your Holy Spirit that we know that you're always with us. You go behind us. You go before us. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you're inside of us. Do your good works in us. Make new wine out of us. And help us, Lord, to be what you want us to be as we move through this time together. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Make me an offering. That's what that song says. Make us an offering. And help us to keep our eyes on the goodness of our God. We see his goodness in so many ways, and one of the ways is through your hearts of generosity in your giving. Because of that generosity, Aldersgate Church is able to continue to be the church that God desires. We give of ourselves by sharing our resources with one another, by sharing our time in serving others, and also by offering the gifts of praise and worship through song. We do this when we come together in this building, Aldersgate Church, but we also do it in the safety and the comfort of our own homes. Because of who God is, he deserves our praise when things are going great, but even more so when things are not going the way we think that they should go, when we find ourselves wandering on the desert road. God is the God who grows. 
God, as we come before you today, we confess that we are on a desert road in a journey that sometimes feels too hard, too lonely, too fearful, and too painful. And yet you remind us in your word, O oh God, that you are God, and we are not. And there's no road that we walk, that we walk alone. And so, O oh God, in the comfort and the safety of our own homes, we now open up our minds and our hearts to you. Help us to see what we cannot see on our own. Help us to hear the possibilities that we just can't hear on our own. And open up our hands and our hearts to reach out and to love others with your love. We ask, O oh God, that you would just uphold those who are working on our behalf, for the healthcare workers, for the nurses, for the moms and the dads, for the children and the students, for the seniors, for the college students, for the elderly and those in nursing homes. God, we could spend the rest of the day just in communion with you, asking for your mercies. There's so much that's on our heart and our mind to pray for and to ask for your love and your care. And so this day, as we worship together, as we are separate together bind us with your love and your love only and then scatter us lord throughout this next week that all that we say and do would bring honor and glory to you in the name of jesus we pray amen do you remember what you were doing when you first received the news that we were to be sheltered in place what were you feeling at that time when you found out that we were in the midst of a global pandemic, that there was no one on this planet Earth that was not potentially affected by COVID-19? If you were like me, perhaps you were met with fear and anxiety and uncertainty, and then also the possibility of pause of quiet, of change of schedule and change of pace, of having time just to breathe in an altogether busy world in which we had come from. I often think that that day, perhaps I thought about other days that were familiar in my life, maybe the night in which a snowstorm started and I was teaching high school English and I was wondering, tomorrow might we be canceled? Might tomorrow be a day that nothing is expected of me? I get to stay home. And typically, when those snowstorms came, I would be up and dressed the next day, ready to get in the car and drive my 40 minutes to my high school, and then the phone would ring. But sometimes, sometimes I would get the call the night before. The snow had been forecasted. And the snow was already coming down. And it was clear that it would continue to come. And so the phone call would come. And the breath, the respite, the openness of the schedule would come along with that phone call. I could stay up at night with a cup of hot chocolate and look at the snow falling outside. I could get up in the morning and I could lay around in my jammies. And the schedule, the day was free. Perhaps, perhaps it rings familiar chords for you of this time where you thought and I thought that this is a breath, 
This is a pause in life. This is a time when perhaps we could go back to the familiar. Perhaps we could find some of the things that we've lost in being so busy and our schedules so full. It's much like having a familiar song in your head, one that you sing over that you don't even have to look for the lyrics. You don't have to look in the hymn book. I think of the song, Amazing Grace. This is a song that if you have been raised in the church, that you probably would have sung this hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. The writer of this song, John Newton, in 1772 penned the words to Amazing Grace, but he penned them out of the lyrics of his own life. For John Newton was working on a slave ship, and he was working for a slave trader, and John worked himself up until he was the slave trader. And he would bring slaves from Africa, and he would sell those slaves as if they weren't human beings, as if they were just property. But John's spirit and soul started to become active. God began a good work in John Newton. John began to seek the living God, so much so that he had to leave the ship. He had to leave being a slave trader. He knew that this dishonored God's people, and he was dishonoring his own soul. And so he wrote those familiar lyrics, Amazing Grace, and we sing them. And perhaps we thought that the melody of that song would never change. And then, and then came a man named Chris Tomlin. <laughs> Chris Tomlin added a melody to the lyrics of Amazing Grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, he ransomed me. And oh, like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Were the lyrics of this song the same? Yes. Was amazing grace, amazing grace? Yes. But Chris Tomlin added a new melody in which we can sing a familiar song. Friends, I'd like you to consider today as you listen to this word and you listen to the word of God that perhaps in the midst of this difficult time of COVID-19, that perhaps we are to sing a familiar song, that perhaps we're to go back and find the song that defines our life, the song of Jesus seeking us in our life, and that perhaps, just perhaps, we are being asked to sing a different melody, a different melody, a different behavior, to a familiar song. And so I'd like to take you back in the times of the early church where Jesus had spent time with his disciples after he was resurrected. He spent time with them and he taught them this song, this song of salvation, this song of good news. He was resurrected. And then the promise of the Holy Spirit was included in this beautiful song of salvation. And Jesus taught this incredible song to his disciples. And then he said to them, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And now what you're to do is I want you to go out into all the nations, Samaria, Galilee, Judea, and beyond to the uttermost ends of the earth. And I want you to sing the song of salvation. And I imagine that the followers of Jesus would have said, we know what you've taught us, Jesus. We understand the song, but what is the melody to this song? What are the melody to the lyrics of this song? And Jesus said, you wait on me, and when you go, my spirit will give you the melody. 
and it will be a melody that you have not heard ever before. And friends, it certainly was. You see, the Jews were used to coming to the temple once a year for sacrifice. That was their lyrics. That was their liturgy. That's what was familiar. But after Jesus was resurrected, Jesus birthed the church and birthed the church in a melody that I think you and I perhaps have forgotten. Jesus birthed the church to be scattered to be scattered to the ends of the nations, to go out on desert paths and to tell and to sing the song of Jesus. And so I'd like to take you to Luke's account of the early church in Acts chapter 8. One of the followers of Jesus named Philip was a follower who was passionate and in love with Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life. And Philip was attuned to the nudgings of the Holy Spirit. And so we begin in chapter 8. If you have your Bibles open, you'll want to go to Acts chapter 8, to Luke's account of this man's life, Philip. And we begin actually in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, Rise and go to the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. The Holy Spirit, an angel, told Philip where he was, go, he was to go to sing this new song, the good news of Jesus. And then Philip puts in almost a postscript to this directional command and he says this is a desert road now friends whenever i see one of the gospel writers doing something like this it always piques my curiosity i mean what does it mean was it important it's a desert road okay it's a desert road and a little bit of research reveals that there's meaning to these very small statements for it wasn't that it was in a desert. It really wasn't a desert road. What Luke was telling us is that a desert road means this. It means that this is a road that is not well traveled. This is a road off the beaten path. This is a melody that is to accompany the song, the lyrics of a familiar story. And so Philip obeys. We've seen the first movements as Jesus commissioned his followers to go and to declare the good news of Jesus. And then now we see Philip even going further from rise up to the south, to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, an unfamiliar path that Philip was to go. But Philip, not understanding where he would go, what he would see, who he would encounter. The only thing that was important to this follower of Jesus is if he heard a word from the Lord, if he felt a nudging in his spirit, he didn't need to trust his own efforts and his own mind, his own intellect. He only needed to trust and obey. And Luke tells us he did just that. In verse 27, we read, And Philip rose and went, and behold, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. Luke tells us an awful lot of this story in this one verse. Philip, as he rose and went, encountered the person that the Spirit had already gone in front of him and was prepared for him to encounter. This was an unknown Ethiopian, an African, a eunuch, a minister of the Pharaoh. He was responsible for all of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Pharaoh. 
So this eunuch had means, had wealth, had position, had authority. And what we find is that this eunuch, in verse 27, Luke tells us that he was just coming from Jerusalem to worship. He had just come from temple worship. Now, what would an African be doing coming to Jerusalem? Well, we read between the lines and we understand that this eunuch was a proselyte. He was a convert to Judaism. And so he had made the long trek. He had the means to do so. And so his chariot and those with him had made a 200-mile trek to the temple in Jerusalem because he was seeking the God of the Israelites. He was seeking the one true God that could fill his heart and his soul and his life with peace and joy and understanding. And Luke tells us that he must have gone to the temple, but I wonder why would he have gone to the temple? Because we know in the context of that time that first of all, the law required that any foreigner would not be allowed in where the Jews were worshiping. So this eunuch would have to stay in the outer courts of the temple. He would not be allowed to go in even though he pledged his love and his belief in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then secondly, there was another obstacle. This eunuch would not be allowed to go in the temple because he was a eunuch. He was castrated. This was a common practice among those in the palace so that the palace and the pharaohs would not be threatened. There would be no progeny. There would be loyalty. And so again, the law required he would not have access to the temple. And yet, he was a seeker, and he was determined to seek, and he went. And we find that Luke tells us that as he's leaving the temple, and he's in his chariot, and he's going home, he has the scrolls of the prophets, and he's reading the word. He's reading from Isaiah 53, and he's reading that, and that's how Philip comes upon this eunuch is Philip comes upon him and, and he looks at this eunuch and he sees he's reading the prophecy and Philip does something amazing that I hope convicts you as it convicts me. Philip doesn't think about this eunuch, about who he is and what obstacles and what are the reasons that he shouldn't approach this eunuch. After all, he's not a Jew. He might be unclean and certainly he's a eunuch. So again, the law would require keep distance. And Philip, Philip is told by the Spirit, told by the Spirit to go and to approach this eunuch. And it's almost this approach that's passionate, that Philip goes right up to the eunuch. And Philip asks the eunuch a simple question. He doesn't go to the eunuch and throw theology at him. He doesn't go to the eunuch and throw judgment at him. He doesn't stand at a social distance uh, acceptable uh, distance between he and the eunuch, he goes to that eunuch and he says, what are you reading? And do you understand what you're reading? The most compassionate question that I think could be asked from a prophet to a seeker, what are you reading? And do you understand what it is that you're reading? And the eunuch replies and says, how can I understand I don't know, who is this prophecy referring to? Is it Elijah? Is it another prophet? And with that, do you see, Philip was sent to the ends of the earth, to the desert road, to that place that wasn't well-traveled, to go beyond the boundaries, and Philip was prepared to share the story, to sing the song with the lyrics that Jesus had already planted in his heart, and Philip was able to say to the eunuch, I know whom this passage is speaking of. It's speaking of the Messiah. It's speaking of my Savior. It's speaking of Jesus. And the song just tumbles from Philip's lips. 
And Philip tells the eunuch the story of Jesus. He tells the eunuch about Jesus' ministry and his healings. And I can imagine that he tells the story with grief and despair about how Jesus hung on a cross and how they crucified him. And then he tells the eunuch of the story about how Jesus wasn't in the tomb after the third day. That Jesus rose from the dead and that Jesus was alive and he saw him and how Jesus proclaimed a new story in Philip's life. And he shares that story. And Luke tells us that the eunuch heard with his heart. His heart was opened up. Oh, Philip sang the song, but it's the Spirit of God who does the work that the song becomes our song in our hearts and our souls and in our spirits. Don't take credit for what the Holy Spirit is doing in someone's life. We need seekers in our life, but we need to be humble when we're met with a seeker to know that we can sing the song, not our song, but we can sing a song of love and mercy, of peace and acceptance, regardless of who the seeker is. And that eunuch... Luke tells us, received those words. He had discernment and understanding. And he said, I accept these words. I believe. And Philip must have told him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being baptized. And, and the eunuch is saying, Philip, why can't I be baptized? Look, there's water nearby. I want to be baptized. I want this outward sign of an inward transformation that has taken place in my life. And Philip goes to the crux of our faith. The only thing that matters in our faith, the primary ingredient of our faith. And Philip says, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you, then you can be baptized. Do you hear the lack of boundaries, the lack of law, the lack of restrictions in Philip's behavior. It is though Philip was given a melody that he could sing the familiar song of Jesus, but he was willing to be guided to sing this song differently. To sing this song in a manner that an outsider, a foreigner, an outcast, someone who wouldn't be comfortable coming in the doors of our church could hear this melody and could be drawn into the song and the lyrics of the story of Jesus' love and could accept that love and publicly confess. And Luke tells us the beautiful end of this story, that after the baptism that Philip was caught up and he was taken from the eunuch, but it didn't matter, you see, because the eunuch had Jesus. The eunuch was now filled with the joy of the Spirit. And those two went on in their separate desert roads, in their separate paths. The eunuch back to Africa to proclaim the story with his melody. And Philip to continue to go to the ends of the earth and to sing the song of salvation, always attuned to the melodies that the Spirit would place on his heart. Friend, I want to speak to you today because I want to ask you, do you sing the lyrics of the love of Jesus in your heart? If you don't, then I'd like I'd like to begin a friendship with you so that you could learn the lyrics, so you could know them in your heart, so that you could know that there's nothing that you can do that would separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, that God's love will pursue you, that God loves you so much that God could never be ashamed of you, that God's love will greet you in any dark place that you find or you have found yourself. But for the rest of us who know the lyrics, I'd like to challenge us that perhaps we need to learn some new melodies. 
Here we are in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of being sheltered in our place, our churches empty, our stores, our restaurants empty. We have had to learn a new melody of living, haven't we? And some of us have become very tired, very disappointed. We're ready for this to end, but let's not negate the pause that COVID-19 has given us. Because in all of the sadness and the tears and the death and the illness, God is willing to redeem this time. God is aching to remind us, do you know the song of my love? Can you come back and hear the song of my love in your heart? And then, are you willing, are you willing to learn some different melodies? as we have learned different melodies, different behaviors and how to live, we have to continue to learn different ways in which we can be followers of Jesus. I don't believe that we will ever be the same again. Oh yes, there'll be some practices and some behaviors that we'll go back and we'll probably forget some of the things that we did differently in COVID-19. There'll be just distant memories, different melodies, and yet there's some melodies that we have an opportunity, a privilege, and an obligation to engage upon and to live out. One of those melodies is in this yellow phase of where we find ourselves as we're hoping to get into a yellow phase. We're in this red phase. Red phase is we are sheltered in place and we must wear our masks and, and we can't engage with one another except through digital means or social distance. And so in this red phase, we want to propose to you that there is a melody in which you can live into. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to be brave and to go on a desert road, one that has not been traveled by you or by me. This is a new road. I'm asking that you would gather some of your neighborhood, some of your friends, and maybe leave some empty places to invite those that are not yet understanding the song of Jesus. And that you would gather together in what we call a house church, that you would be Aldersgate at home, and that you would find a time together in this group of 10 or 12, that you would gather together, you sign up with us, or you tell us, this is my group, and you come together and you find a convenient time in which you would watch the worship service. And then we're going to provide you with three simple discussion questions that will engage one another and engage the application of Scripture and this message into your very lives. You'll have an opportunity on a platform such as Zoom or Google Hangout to pray for one another. It's what we can't do in this platform. You'll have an opportunity to care for one another, just like the early church gave of their possessions. If one was in need, another said, I have this. You'll be able to share what you have and be blessed by this community of people coming together. And in time, we hope that you'll be able to serve together as a small family church, that you'll be able to go out and impact the world together. This is house church. This allows you to connect with a smaller group in a way in which we can't connect right now. And then as we move from this yellow phase into an all clear green phase when we can all come back together, leaving no one behind, inclusive, to come back and be the gathered church. Oh, will we rejoice. What a day that will be. But I pray that we will have an understanding that as the Acts Church taught us, that we are both a gathered church and we are a scattered church church, that we both come together to be equipped and to be able to learn and to be able to be encouraged, but then we also scatter to equip and to learn and encourage. And so my hope and my prayer is we are not just one or the other, that we are both and, that we are both a gathered physical church 
and that we have these house churches that as your lives fill up and your schedules get full and perhaps Sunday morning might not be the best time that you can say, I want to sing the familiar story of my faith. And so I'm going to have this wonderful group of family around me who will care for me, who will help disciple me as I disciple them, who will worship with me, who will grow with me. This will be my house church and we will come together and celebrate. We will be both gathered and we will be both scattered. So today I'm asking, will you be a Philip? Will you take the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza and will make that bend off the road to that not so well-worn path to something new, something that you're not sure, well, how will this work? How long will it work? Do I have any guarantees? Will I feel comfortable? But that you'll take this desert road, this new road off the beaten path and that you'll sign up that you'll find others and you'll encourage them. Let's come together so we can worship together and grow together and we can sing the song with a different melody, but we'll all sing the same song. And so today, will you be that Philip? Will you take that step? And will we live into new ways of being church? I'd like to pray for you right now. Holy God, as we have just listened to this testimony of Luke and understand what the Spirit asked Philip to do and Philip responded with enthusiasm, trepidation, yes, uncertainty, yes, but obedience, most certainly. God, we are asking that you would stretch us, whether we are 60, 70, 80, whether we're 15, 20, 30, 40. Oh God, take us off our familiar track of living and help us to go to that desert road and find new ways to be church, new ways to connect to those outside of our gathering, new ways to bring others to learn the lyrics, and to sing the song of your salvation. We thank you so much, Jesus, for loving us. Help us now to be obedient. Give us all the strength that we need to be the people that you call us to be. Always, only for Jesus, we live for you. Amen. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. John.